Good morning, Calvary. How are you today? Uh, we have a special guest with us, and uh, he has been here all weekend. Um, I did an interview with him last night and first service this morning, and then he is speaking. He had the last service and this service. Um, so you may want to go back and, and uh, get on our YouTube channel and, and watch that interview. Fascinating. Um, also, he was on my wife's podcast yesterday, so that'll be coming out here in the next uh, few days, but uh, talks, uh, talked a lot about freedom in America and uh, the political process. You may want to tune into that. Um, Eric is, a, is from New York City. So he's a New Yorker. And uh, so born and raised there. He is an author. He also does, um, and not just an author, like I'm an author, but he's a New York Times best-selling author whole different category. He has written a number of books, uh, including one on Bonhoeffer and Martin Luther, and uh, also the one he's talking about today, Amazing Grace, on the life of William Wilberforce. He does a daily radio program, heard on KNKT every single day. He also has a weekly television program. Um, he is a very intellectual guy. He's a fun guy, and uh, he uh, not only is a writer, but I Come to find out, I think he wrote the last X-Lax commercial. <laughs> so come on, that is, that is something in and of itself, right? Would you please welcome our friend, Eric Metaxas. The last X-Lax commercial, that's actually true. Now, now I have to explain it to these poor people <laughs> when they should be hearing the word of God. I rebuke you, Skip. Uh, you're my friend. I could, I could do that. Wow, what a blessing to be here. Uh, I, is that the smoker's lounge? I just have to say, it looks like a smoker's lounge. I always feel sorry for the people in there. It is a blessing. Uh, it is a blessing to be here. Honestly, uh, I, I get so encouraged uh, when I visit this church. There are not many churches uh, like that. I just appreciate uh, your, your pastor uh, and Lenya and the staff here, and I love getting to meet you all as I'm signing books or whatever. It really uh, is a blessing. The next time I will bring my wife, I promise, um, because she, I tell her these stories, and I'm like, I, I think she doesn't believe me. You know, like, all oh, these wonderful people, and they listen to my radio program. She's like, mm nah, because she doesn't listen to the program. If you listen, who listens to my program here? I'm curious. It's like, that's a lot of people, right? You know more about me than my own wife. Okay, because I share on the radio program at home, I just clam up. Um, I want to tell you uh, the story today of one of the most inspiring figures in history, not in Christian history, in history, uh, whose name is William Wilberforce. Now, Wilberforce uh, will be known to some of you. How many people here saw the film Amazing Grace? Anybody? Okay, so you guys can go take a cigarette break in the smoker's lounge. You don't, you don't need to listen. Um, but actually, you are listening in there, aren't you? But really, you should be smoking. Why are you in that, in that filthy lounge? Um, the story of Wilberforce is kind of funny, because once you know the story, you're embarrassed you didn't know it before. And that happens to me over and over with the characters I write about, that you think, this is so important. How, how, how have I missed this up to this point uh, in my life? Uh, uh, Lenya has a podcast that we were talking yesterday about another book I wrote. Maybe the next time I come here, I can talk about that. It's it's called If You Can Keep It, The Forgotten Promise of American Liberty. And, and it was the same thing when I wrote that book. You sort of discover stuff and you think, how have I lived this long and I've missed this because this is so important about America. But the story of Wilberforce um, is really so much like that, that unless I tell you the story, you kind of won't believe it, I think. Because he's, let, let's put it this way, he's most famous, if you have heard anything about him. Um, he is the man who, in Parliament in 1807 uh, had the victory over the slave trade in the British Empire, right? Now, a lot of people, you know, kind of like, what's that? What's the difference between slave trade and slavery or whatever? Well, the slave trade, just to make it clear, it's, it's a really weird thing, right? Because in America, we had slavery here. So you saw it in front of you. But in England, they had a tr huge slave trade but they didn't have any slaves in England. What they would do was they would send these ships from the four harbors, uh, or really it was three of their major four harbors, that, and the ships would go down to uh, the west coast of Africa, pick up their human cargo, 
and then they would take it across the to the West Indies. And all the sugar plantations were there. So they would then take the molasses and whatever back to England. Nobody in England ever saw what was going on. They just knew that their economy's booming or whatever. Most English people didn't know that they're participating in a satanic slave trade. They just knew that the economy's good and we get sugar in our tea and, and that kind of stuff, you know? And so Wilberforce believed that if he ended the slave trade, slavery would go away. Um, that didn't exactly happen. They had to end slavery itself. But the main goal, of course, was to end the slave trade. Uh, and this came from a biblical worldview. But I want to tell you how this all happened. Uh, and I really do think that the story of Wilberforce, when you know it, it can't help but inspire you to want to live a great life for God. So let me just start at the beginning. He was born in 1759 uh, into a family that really was wealthy. They were merchants. Um, but the funny thing when I tell the story, and, and I have to say again, I didn't know this either, right? I'm not like a guy who knows a lot of stuff and they say, oh, I think I'll write a book about this. I just knew that this man had led the battle because of his Christian faith to end the slave trade. So he's a hero. Okay, I'll write a book about him. But when I wrote the book, I discovered all kinds of stuff I didn't know. For example, when he grew up in the middle part of the 1700s, okay, he's born in 1759, England was nominally Christian, okay, officially Christian. But do I need to tell you that if you have a booming slave trade, you're not that Christian? Um, there are a lot of countries that are officially Christian that don't behave very Christian, okay? Uh, you could talk about Germany in the 1930s. I wrote about William, I wrote about uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Germany was officially Lutheran, right? Well, everybody, we're German, we're Lutheran, great except they're not living it out. If you don't understand that, you know, hating Jews uh, is not part of God's plan uh, or speaking against uh, Nazis, you know, if you don't get that, how Christian are you, okay? So a lot of people can be Christian in name only or uh, sometimes Christians are, are Christians more than a name only but not nearly where God wants them to be. Um, and so people can all recognize, recon, uh, sorry, reconcile all kinds of wicked behavior. But in England at this time, you could really say that they really were Christian in name only. When they said we're Christian, it means we're not Turks, we're not Muslims, uh, we're not atheists, uh, we're not uh, Buddhists, we're not, we're not Jews, we're Christians. Well, they didn't behave as Christians. Now the irony is that America today is not officially Christian. We're not officially anything. But I would say when you're not officially something, you have the freedom to really be Christian. Because when it's enforced by the government, you just go, well, you know, on my birth certificate, it just says that I'm this and, and you know, and you don't, you, it, it's not, you don't own it, it's not yours. So everybody in England says, I, I'm a Christian because Christian, we have the Church of England and the, the queen or the king is the defender of the faith and so we're an officially Christian nation. But something happened in the previous century, in the 1600s, there have been some religious wars and so the culture of England, not that it ever was tremendously Christian, but in the uh, 18th century they began to retreat from robust faith of any kind and the pulpits were preaching what you'd call French Enlightenment rationalism, right? You know it's bad because it's French, right? Just kidding. Uh, French Enlightenment rationalism means we don't really believe in anything. We believe in, you know, there's a God up there someplace, but we're not, we don't believe in Jesus and the Bible, or whatever. It was this kind of thin Enlightenment rational view of things that, that has nothing to do with the Jesus of the Bible and the Gospels and so on and so forth. So, so England is officially Christian, but they're not living it out at all. And throughout the 1700s, you have a situation where if you really pull God out of the equation, we know the culture is going to suffer, right? Who's going to suffer the most? The poor. So Wilberforce is born in the middle of this century uh, into a family that has a, has a good amount of money, but just like all the elites in particular in that century, they looked down on anybody who had serious Christian faith. Uh, if you think about the 18th century, you have the 
great awakening because of the preaching of uh, George Whitfield and because of the preaching uh, of the, the, the Wesley brothers, John and Charles Wesley, you, you have this revival, but it's only among the poor, mainly. The elites look down on the poor and they look down on anybody who had serious Christian faith. In fact, they call them Methodists. They're sort of making fun of the fact that the Wesleys, when they got saved at Oxford University, they, be they became sort of so obsessed with religion and prayer and stuff that they said they're very methodical. So they made fun of them, they called them Methodists. Uh, and of course, they eventually took it as a badge of honor. But the Brits also said, if you're really you know, serious about God and all that stuff, you're an enthusiast, which is like saying a holy roller, uh, a Bible thumper. The whole culture looked down on it. So the elites were really hostile to any of this Christian faith. And so throughout the culture, you don't have much Christian faith. So Wilberforce grows up in a family just like that. Uh, when he is about nine years old, his, uh, his father dies, and his mother gets very ill. And the grandfather and the mother say, we need to send him to live with this aunt and uncle because she wasn't able to care for him. And so they sent him to live with this very wealthy aunt and uncle. They were so wealthy that you know the mother and the grandfather, how could we go wrong sending him to, to them? This is going to be you know wonderful. Well, what they didn't know is that the aunt and uncle were Methodists, born again, evangelical, whatever you want to call it. In fact, not only that, they were so wealthy, they were practically funding the entire Methodist movement, which I find hilarious. So they send this little boy off to live with them, and he encounters these loving, uh, this loving aunt and uncle, and he comes to faith. He was very intelligent, very sensitive, and he comes to faith, he, he comes to love this aunt and uncle with all his heart, and they love him like a son. And John Newton, who wrote the hymn Amazing Grace, he was the slave trader who became a Christian and then became a preacher, he would visit this home. And little Wilberforce uh, uh, thought of him like, like a father figure. And so it's this wonderful time. But then the mother and the grandfather, being classic elites of that day, when they discovered this, about two and a half years into this, they were horrified. It's like he'd been kidnapped by a cult. You know, those Christians, they're nuts. So they bring him back home, and they are determined to scrub his soul clean of Methodism. They don't even let him go on Sundays to their dead Anglican church because he might hear the scriptures read. And so they do everything they can. He tries to cling to his faith, this brilliant young man. He sends letters, secret letters via the maid uh, to his aunt and uncle. He's trying to cling to his faith. But by the time he's 16 and goes off to Cambridge University, it's, it's really evaporated. And he's become exactly what they hoped. You know, an intelligent, insouciant man about town, sophisticated, knowing that, you know, the enthusiasts are just uh, way too much. It's not for me. Well... While he is there at Cambridge, he becomes friends with William Pitt the Younger. Now, some of you know that's the son of William Pitt the... Correct. How do you know that? That's amazing. Uh, William Pitt the Elder is one of the great statesmen of that time, right? He was uh, in the House of Lords, but he was a, a great political figure, and he was training his young son... William Pitt the Younger, to be a great statesman, you know, memorizing uh, Latin uh, uh, phrases, you know, at his father's knee and stuff. So Wilberforce, he comes from this merchant background, but he meets William Pitt the Younger, and, and they start going together from Cambridge to London to visit the Houses of Parliament, to sit in the gallery, and to watch the debates on the floor below. And Wilberforce, uh, you know, 18, 19 years old, is mesmerized by what's going on. He thinks, I think I want a life in politics. Now, you know, you have to understand what was the debate going on at that time in the House of Lords that he was watching. Well, this is about 1776. So this was about the fate of the colonies. I mean, this was historical. And he says, I want to become a politician. So he graduates at the same time as his friend William uh, uh, Pitt, the younger, graduates. And they immediately get elected to parliament. Now, in those days, not just the culture was broken, but the political system was so corrupt that you literally bought your votes. You literally paid people to vote for you, right? Uh, it, it was a horrible system, but he manages to get elected. His friend William Pitt gets elected, and the two of them rock it up in the ranks of the political order in their early 20s, so that by the time William Pitt the younger is 24 years old, 
he's elected Prime Minister of England. Now, I don't know about you, but I find that impressive. Anybody here ever get elected Prime Minister in their 20s? You think it's, no, you think it's so easy? Uh, it's like crazy. Now, William Pitt is Prime Minister, but his best friend Wilberforce also gets this incredibly powerful position. And they become very powerful figures. Uh, you know, they're members of all the top gentlemen's clubs and their, their pictures are in the papers. That's not true, there was no photography, okay, in 1780. I tricked you. Um, but uh, the eight o'clock crowd got that joke. Shame on you. Uh, so can you imagine, he, all this comes to him and then one day he decides, because you know, the recess from parliament is months long, he wants to take a long vacation um, his mother's health, you know, was not so good, so they thought, oh, we need to go to the French and Italian Rivieras for the, for the climate, right? And those days, the French and Italian Rivieras were located in, in France and Italy. Um, I think they're still there now, but I, don't, I have to look at a map. So this is a trip. Can you imagine to go from England all the way across the continent with, you know, uh, horses, with a coach, uh, to, the, to the southern part of France. This is a vast journey, okay? So his mother was going to travel in a coach with a cousin, and he was going to travel in a coach with a friend. So he picks a friend, the friend can't come, and then he says, well, I need somebody to, you know, it's going to be very boring. So he stumbles on an old schoolmate, or I should say somebody who was uh, ahead of him a number of years, who is my favorite character in the book, in the story. His name is Dr. Isaac Milner. And Isaac Milner was a physical giant. I don't know how big he was, but he was everybody just, he was a giant of a man. Now, it becomes funnier when you think Wilberforce was literally five foot two, and at one point during his illness, he weighed 76 pounds. So he was a kind of a thin guy, kind of a little guy. So he picks Milner. Now, Milner was not just famous for being a giant, he was probably literally the smartest man in England at the time. He was, uh, he had the Lucasian chair uh, in um, chemistry or physics, I forget, at Cambridge, okay? Uh, Isaac Newton, who invented calculus, <laughs> and, uh, the, uh, and, and Stephen Hawking, who just passed away, you know, they have this lifetime, lifetime appointment. So it's super smart people, smartest people in the world. So that's Isaac Milner, okay? So not only is he a super genius, but he also was famous for being a teller of comic stories, funny stories. And so you think, who could possibly be a better companion? He's like, like you know, combination of like Stephen Hawking and, you know, you name it. I don't know. Um, and they decide, okay, we're going to go together. We're going we're gonna to take this trip across the continent. This is going to be months, you know, to, to, get, to get there and months uh, to come back. So... They go on the journey, and we they're talking about everything. Wilberforce was a fascinating conversationalist himself and very witty. And uh, they've gone just far enough that they can't turn back. I don't know how far that is, 500 miles, something like that. And the subject of religion comes up. And to Wilberforce's horror, Isaac Milner reveals that he is a Methodist. Can you imagine? You'd be like, oh, no. Now what do I do? And he kind of tries to crack some jokes to kind of bat it away. But Milner says, well, you know, no, no, no. I think, uh, you know, you're, you're above that, uh, Mr. Wilberforce. I think, you know, if you'd like to have a serious conversation, we, we should. So they have a serious conversation. And I always picture this giant Milner crushing Wilberforce's intellectual objections like walnuts in his big meaty paws. Like, you know, and throwing the shells out the window. As the, as the miles go by, he's just one by one. And Wilberforce, to his credit, was intellectually honest, okay? Like a lot of people today would just be like, hey, I don't care. <laughs> Wilberforce thought, if you're making the case and you're right, I'm stuck. And by the time of this trip uh, ending, he knows that he's been wrong, that the Bible is true, that Jesus is his Lord and Savior. There's no way out. I'm in, it's true. But when he gets back to London, he's very bummed out because he knows the world in which he has been traveling. He's a member of these five gentlemen's clubs where they stay out drinking and, and, and singing and gambling and joking till four and five in the morning. And that, that whole life, he realized, I can't do that anymore. Uh, I, uh, I probably have to leave politics. What am I going to do? He was not happy. So he goes to visit his old friend, John Newton. Remember I said he, when he was a little boy, he, he'd befriended him. He hadn't seen him in all these years. And I imagine John Newton had been praying for him. Can you imagine? 
that this guy that you knew back then has you know, drifted away from the faith and now he's one of the most powerful people in England. So he goes like Nicodemus secretly to meet John Newton to ask him, what do I do? But he didn't want people to see him going there because he was so famous at this point that if people see him going there, they're going to know something's up. So he goes there secretly and John Newton says to him, I don't think you should leave politics. Because, you know, a lot of us, we buy into that bad theology. Like, I got saved, now I'm going to go to the ministry. Well, what does that mean? Ministry doesn't need to mean you pastor a church. or you. Pre ministry could be anything you do practically, right? You can bring God into wherever you are. And, and John Newton says to him, I think God would call you to bring him into politics and to let him use you as a top political figure for his purposes in history at this time. Wilberforce, to his credit, accepts this. And he says, even though it's going to be hard, even though I'm going to be mocked by these elites, I believe this is God. And so he decides to stay in politics, but he's going to pray and study the scripture and other books about, Lord, what would you have me do? So two years into his faith, he writes in his journal 20 famous words. I don't remember what they are, but there's 20 of them. Just, just kidding. I, I do remember the 945. Uh, uh, they got that joke. What did, Skip, you said, okay. So, so basically, he writes these words in his diary, and these are the 20 words. He says, God Almighty has set before me two great objects. Okay, God has set before me. He's, he didn't say, this is my idea. He believes that the Lord has called him to these two great objects of his life, the suppression of the slave trade, which was basically impossible, right? And, if that's not enough, the reformation of manners or morals or culture, which is, you could describe it as, oh, and, and everything else, right? In this broken culture where the gospel is not evident, uh, everywhere you looked, there is evil. If you don't have Jesus in the equation, it's a broken culture. I, I, I don't think I, I, I shared the statistics, but it was such a broken culture that you don't just have this abomination called slavery and the slave trade. You also have a lack of Christian worldview evident in everything. Nobody cared for the poor. Imagine living in a world, today we argue about how to care for the poor, okay? Liberals say the government should do it. Conservatives say the private sector should do it. We argue about how. Not whether. We all know, of course, we're supposed to do something to help people who are struggling. The question is what? Imagine living in a time where everybody says, no, we're not, and we don't even give it a thought. The reason you're poor is because you made bad decisions and tough luck. It's not my problem. And the reason I'm rich is because God likes me and he's blessed me. Imagine having that worldview. That is the opposite of a Christian worldview, is it not? God tells us we are blessed to be a blessing. If God has given you anything, time, money, talent, Good looks, doesn't matter what it is. If it's good and he gave it to you, he gave it to you for his purposes. So imagine living in a world where nobody knows that. Living in a world where everybody says, this, whatever I have that's good, it's for me. So Wilberforce grows up in a world like that. He becomes a Christian, and the first thing he sees through his Christian eyes is the slave trade is evil. Okay, is God calling me to that? Well, Two years into this faith, he realizes God is calling me in parliament to be a, a voice in politics for this issue. There had been a lot of serious Christians, Methodists, born-again believers, who knew this was an issue, but they had no political power. They're praying for a figure in parliament. So Wilberforce steps up, says yes. But then the everything else is the brokenness of the culture beyond the horror of the slave trade. There was child labor, little kids working six, seven years old in dangerous conditions 14 hours a day. Imagine that kind of a poverty where there's no rules against that. Uh, you imagine that they were being sexually abused, all kinds of horrors. Alcoholism was utterly rampant in that culture on a level we can't even imagine. Uh, some of you might be familiar with the Hogarth Prince of Gin Alley. I mean, these people just, just absolutely lost in poverty and misery, dying of young ages of all kinds of diseases and unable to raise their kids. This was absolutely endemic in this culture. To give you one uh, factoid to show you how broken was this culture without Jesus, 25% of all the women in London who were single were prostitutes. 
What does that tell you about the men in that culture? The average age of the prostitutes was 16. That's the average age. That is a godless, broken culture. When Wilberforce becomes a Christian and sees through God's eyes, he sees all this. And he realizes God is calling me to step up, to use my talent, the power he's, he's allowed me to have, uh, my abilities, my networks, friends that I know, to work for God's purposes. So he writes this in his journal. The, the other fact, if you want to know how sick the culture was, Wilberforce said this culture is so far away from God, even though we call ourselves officially Christian, he said he wanted to make goodness fashionable. In other words, it was fashionable, it was the cool thing to be bad, right? We see that in our culture, right? Uh, we, we, what do we call it? We say, well, he's a player, okay? Who, who was the leading figure in the land in this time? It was the man who was gonna be King George IV, okay? The eldest son of King George III was the Prince of Wales, who's gonna be the king. He was famous for being immoral. He was famous for running up gigantic gambling debts that the treasury, that's the taxpayers, would have to bail him out of for drinking. He was most famous, and this is the sickest thing of all, he was known in his lifetime to have slept with 7,000 women. I always think once you get past 2,000, that's just crazy stuff. <laughs> Thank you for laughing. You've been a great audience. Good night. Um, but can you imagine, it's not just that he behaved like this, he was known so in that culture, the greatest guy there is who's going to be the king, that's how he behaves. So Wilberforce says, I've got an uphill climb. He says, I want to make goodness fashionable. Not that kind of behavior. I want to make goodness fashionable. I want people to know that doing good is the right thing. So he's facing all of this. He's born again. And the first thing, of course, the, the thing that he's most famous for is this huge battle for the slave trade. And he fights and fights and fights. He fights for 18 years. It's a brutal battle. If you read the book honestly, you realize that if God doesn't call you to the battle, you know, the enemy will just chew you up. You need to know this is God's battle. You need to know I'm here to obey, not to win. I play to win, but I ultimately am here to obey God because... Jesus obeyed God and he was nailed to a tree. Bonhoeffer obeyed God and he was hanged. It's not about winning, it's about obeying God. If you obey God, you already won. Wilberforce does win, but the battle is unbelievable. He obeys God, he does everything. And in 1807, he gets this grand victory after many years. He also had uh, health issues, ulcerative colitis. And, I mean, he really struggled. But he knew God has called me to this battle. But he also knew God had called him to the battle of the reformation of manners, of culture, whatever. And he oversaw the transformation of this culture through all kinds of little groups. He basically was able to speak to the elites of the time and that, you know, a, a, a wealthy woman with nothing really to do was suddenly now thinking that, oh, why don't I get together with the other wealthy women and, and, and we can do something for the poor. They began to get this idea in these elite circles that we need to do something for those who can't help themselves. Um, he had a group of friends around him. I call them the Clapham Circle. Sometimes they're called the Clapham Saints or whatever, but there's a place now, it's really part of London now, but in those days, it's four miles from where Parliament is, and it was like a, a distant suburb, right? And one of this group was uh, John Thornton, he was the, uh, the, the head of the Bank of England. He was one of the wealthiest people in Europe. He decides to use his money for God's purposes. And so he builds a couple of houses so that these people, he invites them, why, why don't you live, we'll live in a kind of community and we'll pray together in the mornings and we'll, we'll meet together and we'll be part of what God can do in England. It's an amazing story, really, uh, of how many different people got involved. One of my favorite figures, I mentioned Isaac Milner, uh, th there's a, a woman named Hannah Moore in my seven women book. She's one of the seven women, uh, and my friend Karen Swallow Pryor wrote a book about her, but she's one of the great figures of this era. She's a literary figure. She was friends with the famous actors, David Garrick, uh, and the, 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 the famous poets, and the famous uh, painters, Josh Reynolds. She was part of that world, and she, like Wilberforce, 
had a heart for God, and, and she's thinking, and how can God use me? And the Lord used her in her giftings. And one of the most amazing things she did was she said, you know, I've been writing all these books and poems and stuff. I need to write literature for poor people who, who don't know uh, how to live, stories that help them, like morality stories, to help them think about their lives and stuff. I mean, she did all kinds of stuff, and then she founded a Sunday school because the rural poor were getting zero education. And she said, I'm going to start educating them and educating them in the things of God. So you have all these different characters who have different pieces of this. Uh, and they start to, to, to fan out through the culture and they start to change things. So you have this huge victory in 1807, but Wilberforce went on to either lead or be a part of innumerable social reforms. Oz Guinness, my dear friend who really introduced me uh, to the life of Wilberforce, considers Wilberforce the greatest social reformer in history. Now, all that he did, he did because of Jesus. Because he understands Jesus changes everything. He does, I don't just get saved and about saving other people. We get saved, but then we're still here. We don't go straight to heaven. What are we supposed to do? We'll save other people. Yeah, yeah, that's part of it. But we're supposed to also serve God in our gifts and, and care for the poor, care for the slaves. If you say, oh, I just want to preach the gospel. I don't want to get involved in politics or whatever. You think, well, you don't care about the slaves rotting in the hold of a slave ship. If you don't care about them... You are missing Jesus and his heart, and what gospel are you going to preach? If you don't care about the poor or whatever, the point is that there's an innumerable uh, number of things for us to do in the name of the Lord. It's not just evangelism, right? That it's part of a bigger thing. It's about sh sharing the kingdom of God. Uh, and so Bonhoeffer gets that, right? He says, I'm not just going to pray. I'm going to get involved in the plot to overthrow Adolf Hitler because millions of people are being murdered. Sometimes God calls us to things. The question is, what is God calling us to? And when you have a personal relationship with him, as Wilberforce did, you can pray and you can say, Lord, what, do you, what would you have me to do? What battles are you calling me to fight? So Wilberforce, after the abolition of the slave trade in 1807, he gets involved in all these other things. One of them is abolition itself, because they saw as time passed that the abolition of the slave trade is not ending slavery. And so he gets involved in abolition. Another thing he did, which uh, there's a chapter in my book, he should be famous for this too. Most people don't even know this. He, he considered it, next to the slavery issue, the most important thing he ever did. And this might sound odd at first, but it was to get missionaries into India. Think of this. The British were making tons of money in India, but they were not sharing the good news of Jesus they were not concerned about the lives of the Indians. They just thought, let's just go there and we'll make our money and we don't have any responsibilities. Well, Wilberforce says, yes, you do. And by the way, there were things going on in India in case you think all religions are equal. Wilberforce would read in the paper how in India, when uh, usually a wealthy man dies, he's burned on a funeral pyre. His body is burned on a funeral pyre. And along with his body burned on the funeral pyre, his living widow is burned to death on the funeral pyre. Wilberforce would read this and be outraged and say, we are there. We are, in Eng we are English people are there in India making tons of money off them. Do we not have a responsibility to help these women and to tell them that we don't care what your customs are? By the way, in England, we have a custom. When you do that to a woman, we hang you to death. You have your customs. We are going to bring our values, our Western Christian values, that you don't murder a woman because her husband died. We're going to bring these values. He said, we need missionaries there. And of course, the business interests, nothing changes. They're making a lot of money. They didn't want missionaries there because they said, if missionaries come here to India, they're going to, they're going to mess up a good thing. We got a good thing going on. There were, there, you know, there were men there that would have you know, five or six teenage wives hanging out, right? I don't want missionaries coming here. Wilberforce fought and fought, and he brought the good news of Jesus, and not just the good news of Jesus, but the, but the shalom life of the kingdom of God to India. And that was a huge battle as well. He did so many different things that it's just mind-blowing. But by the time he died in 1833, what was an utterly godless, broken culture 
had been very dramatically changed. He was probably the first Christian in parliament. By the time he left, there were like 100 members of parliament that were vibrant Christians. The climate of the culture changed dramatically because Wilberforce was called by God when he got saved to do some things, many of which were in politics uh, and many of which were just in the culture. But by the time he dies, 1833, you're on the verge of what's called the Victorian era. The Victorian era is famous for what? Morality. Famous for, you know, groups of, of, of women getting together to, to, to figure out how can we help the poor? How can we do this? How can we do that? It became what he had prayed for. He made goodness fashionable. So by the time he dies, everybody in England knows if I have something, probably I'm supposed to do something good with it. Now, can you imagine we live in a day today where everybody knows that? Why do we know that? We know that, and this is what's incredible to me, is because William Wilberforce and his group of friends managed to import these gospel ideas into the mainstream of the culture. And they did it so successfully that it became part of the warp and woof of Western culture so that anybody in the West today knows slavery's wrong, racism's wrong. If there are people suffering in poverty or this or that, we have some obligation to do something. The social conscience. Can you imagine living in a world with no social conscience? Wilberforce, by the grace of the Lord, brought the idea of helping the poor and all this into the mainstream. So today, as I said, we argue about how to do it, not whether to do it. It is utterly remarkable he was able to do that. He was on his deathbed, by the way, when he received word, this was his last day of consciousness, a young member of parliament in 1833 comes to the bed of Wilberforce to tell him, today in parliament, we have just voted to outlaw slavery, not the slave trade, which was defeated in 1807, but in 1833 to defeat slavery and wipe it out in all of the British Empire. Can you imagine that the Lord gave him this victory on his deathbed an hour, uh, hours before he slips into unconsciousness and two days later goes into the presence of the Savior? His life was used by God so powerfully that in a way it changed things so dramatically because everybody today has a social conscience. We can't even imagine a world without it. So we don't even think about the guy who kind of made it happen. We're like, what, what are you talking about? That's like the guy who made oxygen happen. It's always been here. Like, I don't even know, I don't even know what you're talking about. We can't imagine it because this happened over 200 years ago or roughly 200 years ago, but it's been part of the West ever since. We know that we're blessed to be a blessing. Every atheist, every agnostic, we all know this stuff. Where did it come from? It came from the gospel of Jesus Christ and it was not brought into the mainstream of culture until William Wilberforce was called by God to do those things. Before I close, I just want to tell you a couple of things that he did that were part of how he was able to do this. I mentioned that you have to be called. Just because something's wrong doesn't mean God's calling you to fix it. You can get overwhelmed when you look around at everything that's wrong and you think, what do I do, what do I do? You have to, number one, have a personal relationship with Jesus because only then can he lead you and guide you personally on what, what, am, what am I supposed to do? Uh, you know, I, I'm not called to abolish the slave trade. That's already been done. I'm not called to, what, am I, what are you calling me to do, Lord? Sometimes people are just called to be a good spouse, uh, a good father, a good mother. That's more than enough. What is God calling you to do? Whatever God's calling you to do is all that matters. It's not about saving the world. Wilberforce did what God called him to do humbly and knowing that the battle belongs to the Lord. You need to know that apart from him, you can do nothing. So we need to have that relationship where we say, Lord, I want to walk with you so that whatever I'm doing in my life, on the job, with my family, wherever, I just, I just want to know that you're leading me to those things that you're calling me to do for your purposes. Because our lives are not meant to have no meaning. We're supposed to walk in the joy and the purposes of God. And the story of Wilberforce is a super dramatic example of that. But every single one of us who's on this planet was born for that. And so it's our job to know him personally and have a relationship where we, we ask him continuously, Lord, show me. Show me, Lord. Speak to me. Lead me how you want to lead me so I can do the things that you created me to do. So that's important. The second thing is that Wilberforce had a humility that he was able to love his enemies. So if you're in a battle, whether it's for the unborn or anything, 
Wilberforce knew that apart from the grace of God, I'm on the other side of this battle. So I can't get all cocky and you know morally superior because why am I on the right side of the battle? I, I didn't work my way here. The Lord, by revelation, gave me the gift of seeing what I was blind to before. So he had a humility and a love in the way that he dealt with his opponents that is very powerful. That will freak people out, right? If you fight the way the world fights, then people feel like, okay, I want to I wanna fight you. But if you fight the way God calls you to fight, it's going gonna, it's gonna to look different in a number of ways. Wilberforce was able to speak to the people on the fence with a grace that a lot of them were able to change their minds because of how he communicated. He had the ability, because of his wit and sarcasm, to wipe the floor with his opponents. When he became a Christian, he no longer did that. Even though he could, he didn't do it. There was a grace to him. And so loving our enemies, not just saying, I'm in a battle, but saying, but I've, I've got to exhibit the, the, the spirit of Jesus. Now, Jesus turned over tables. So this doesn't mean you become, you know, Casper Milk Toast, uh, to, to, make a, to make an ancient reference. But um, very important. Wilberforce also understood that I need to have people around me, whether it's a church community. For him, it was this Clapham Circle. People, brothers and sisters who are with me on the journey, maybe not doing exactly what I'm doing, but encouraging me, praying with me. We need to have that. He would say that it's his friends in Clapham. He never could have done what he did. Even, even what he did himself, he couldn't do it because it was so hard to have people praying with you and just being your friends and all that. That's, that's an important part of walking with God, very important part. But then, in a way, the final point is that he was willing to work with his enemies. In other words, there were people in Parliament who were you know, dissolute, swine, okay? People who are womanizers and drunkards and all this kind of stuff. Wilberforce said, I will work with you if we can help end the slave trade because I care more about the suffering slaves than I do about my reputation. There's a lot of Christians that they're all about my witness and my reputation. It's not like that's not important, but you care about looking clean before God more than you care about the person suffering, maybe your priorities are confused. Wilberforce said, I care about the slave. And if I'm gonna have to break bread with sinners, oh, incidentally, someone who's a hero of mine, Jesus of Nazareth broke bread with sinners, so maybe it's okay to break bread with sinners. Your eye has to be on the prize. God is calling me to help the poor. If you don't care about those slaves, it's very easy to say, I'm not gonna work with uh, Charles Fox in Parliament. He's a horribly immoral person. But if you care about the slaves, you care about the people suffering, you say, well, I know that I'm morally no different than Charles Fox. Maybe I can be an influence on him. I will not let him be an influence on me. But if he will work with me on this issue, of course I will work with him. That takes humility. And it also takes perspective that Jesus was reviled by the religious leaders of his day for hanging out with tax collectors who are the scum of the earth and sinners and drunkards and whatever. This is not about not caring about sin, but the point is, what is your focus? Why are you doing what you're doing? Those people may need the love of Jesus in their life. So it's not just about being separate. There's a time to be separate. But what before said, God has called me to this object and I will work with people. I'm not going to be high and mighty and say that the priority of life is for me to keep my hands clean. God's not calling us to sin, but sometimes he, he calls us to work with sinners, knowing we are morally no better than they are apart from what Jesus has done for us, which we didn't deserve. That's why Wilberforce is such a hero of mine, not because he accomplished these things, but because he accomplished them by obeying God and by giving us a model in life, in history, a real model. I'm not like, you know, blowing smoke here. This is all true, and this is just the, the peaks of the mountains here. But that one life submitted to God can sometimes be just so dramatically effective that it's an inspiration to each of us that this is what God has for you in your life is to walk with him with total joy and freedom. It's not about, I need to accomplish stuff for God. No, no, no. To walk with God, he said his burden is light. If there's not a joy and a hope in what you're doing, it's a totally different thing that he calls us to. But he died so we could live that life.
And none of us is living that life perfectly. So to the extent that you are or aren't, I just want to close in prayer that the Lord would reveal to you what he has to you in this story. Father God, we thank you for the life of Wilberforce, but Lord, we know that you're no respecter of persons and that you feel equally toward every person who hears these words now, that you call them to a number of things. First and foremost, to a relationship with yourself so that you can lead them and guide them and bless them and take away the anxiety and help them to bring everything to you in prayer and to walk with you in your purposes while they are on this earth until they see you face to face. Father God, we pray for your anointing on every heart, Lord, to receive what you have this morning and to walk in it with joy in your name. Amen. God bless you. We hope you enjoyed this special service from Calvary Church. We'd love to know how this message impacted you. Email us at mystory@calvarynm.church. And just a reminder, you can support this ministry with a financial gift at calvarynm.church. Thank you for joining us for this teaching from Calvary Church.